I'd like to describe to you now a different neuron model. This one is simpler than the Hodgkin-Huxley uh, neuron. So the goal here is to look at other less complicated neuron models. I'll actually go through a few that are get simpler and simpler. So the Hodgkin-Huxley model is already greatly simplified. Um, you know, there's, it's um, treated as a point in space. The neuron itself is a point in space. There's, we don't consider sort of the spatial extent of the dendrites and things like that. The conductances are approximated with formulas. Um, it only considers sodium and potassium and generic leak currents, but there are other things. There's calcium and, and other things going on, not to mention astrocytes that um, interact with, um, with neurons. So vastly simplified um, architecture. But the th problem is to model a single action potential or a spike takes many time steps of that 4D system. However, spikes are fairly generic and it is thought that the presence of a spike is more important than its specific shape. So instead of modeling the spikes themselves, we're going to offload that to some generic spike phenomenon and look at the subthreshold membrane potential model that. So the leaky integrate and fire or LIF model. The leaky integrate and fire LIF model only considers the subthreshold membrane potential or the voltage, but does not model the spike itself. Subthreshold meaning um, the the voltage or the membrane potential can um, be integrated over time. It's, it goes up and down according to the, the input. Um, <clears throat> but once that voltage or the membrane potential meets the threshold, a spike occurs and that model, the dynamic model, uh, gets hijacked by a different process. We stop modeling the subthreshold integration and instead uh, render a spike and then reset things. Okay, so the leaky integrating fire model does not model the spike itself, only the subthreshold membrane potential that leads up to a spike. And it records, so built in the model has to be some other mechanism to record when a spike occurred. So here's the model. It's basically a capacitance times the rate of change of voltage, capital V for voltage in this case. Um, let's see, draw. So this C here stands for capacitance. And I'm not going to uh, expect you to know the different electrical terms here. This GL here, uh, as we saw in the Hodgkin-Huxley model, is a conductance. Um, now GL <clears throat> is equal to one over resistance. Again, I don't expect you to know these electric uh, laws. And we'll use that in a second. But just like in the, the, the leak term of the Hodgkin-Huxley model, that's the leak conductance times the V minus VL, which is how far we are away from the zero potential uh, voltage. Uh, zero, zero, whatever it was. <clears throat> Just like in the Hodgkin-Huxley model, it's the conductance, the leak is the conductance times how far we are away from the uh, equilibrium. And we also have this input current here. Now we're going to use this um, uh, conductance as 1 over R. So I could put this as 1 over R here and then I can multiply through by R to get rid of that. So let's do that. So I'll have an R here and an R here and that'll just be a 1. Okay. So I end up with RC times dV by dt equals Rjn minus V minus VL. Now this R times C here, if you work it out, it's in units of time. So we're going to call that tau sub m, the time constant. And that dictates how quickly things happen, just like the, the tau, sub in, tau sub n and tau sub h and those things dictated how quickly things happened in the Hodgkin-Huxley model. Now, this R resistance times um, current, we can use Ohm's law, which says that resistance 
times current equals voltage. And so we're going to let V in be that whole term, R times J in. Okay, so let's um, replace these things and rewrite this model. Tau M times dV by dt equals V in minus V minus VL. <clears throat> okay, now I'm going to do a change of variables to simplify things a little bit because we've got these, um, we're sort of measuring the dynamics with respect to some equilibrium voltage VL. By the way, this model is valid only for V less than V threshold, which we'll talk about in a second. So this is the sub-threshold dynamics, th sub -threshold, dynamics of the sub-threshold sub membrane potential. Okay, change of variables. Little v now is going to be V minus VL, so how far we are from equilibrium, over VTH minus VL. So basically, that's kind of the full range that the voltage can take off. It goes from the, the sort of the steady state leak ver value up to the threshold. It can go below the VL as well, but <clears throat> the VL, the equilibrium to the threshold is kind of a fundamental uh, part of the scale. Okay, so then V, little v, goes to zero if V in equals zero. And V equals one is the threshold. <clears throat> okay, so little v in um, is just the uh, the changed the ver the change of variables applied to the big v in. Anyway, you should you should work out this change of variables thing yourself. Replace big big v with this this uh, little v. Well, basically you take the differential equation and you manipulate it. You divide by vth minus vl and um, and do the full change of variables, and you'll see that you end up with a differential equation that looks like this. Tau sub m d little v by dt equals v in minus v. Simpler. This has the, the, the sort of same format as the differential equations we had for m, h, and n in the Hodgkin-Huxley um, model. It's basically just a leaky integrator. It's, uh, it's adding up its input um, and it goes to its equilibrium at a rate according to the time constant, tau m. The, the m of the tau stands for membrane uh, time constant. Okay, <clears throat> so we integrate the differential equation for a given input current or voltage until v reaches the threshold value of 1. So what does that look like? Here's the threshold value of 1. And I'm starting with some voltage here. It the voltage could actually be uh, below the V sub L, but it, or below zero in this case, when you change the variables. Um, but it integrates, integrates, whatever might go up and down, but eventually it's going to hopefully hit that threshold. If the input current is big enough, it's gonna hit that input current. I mean, it's gonna hit that threshold. At that point, we stop integrating, and then we uh, record a spike. A spike at time, I'll call it T1. Then we wait a little bit for tau ref, the refractory time. After that refractory time, we can start integrating again from zero. So we record a spike at time T1 in this case. And after it spikes, it remains the neuron remains dormant uh, during its refractory period, tau ref. It's often just a few milliseconds, and then it starts integrating again. So just to uh, put that in the context of the Hodgkin-Huxley model, you might remember uh, seeing these plots in the, in the first lecture, the last lecture. Now, if you zoom in on these little spikes here, you'll see it looks like this. And you, when this is uh, the subthreshold membrane potential is building up, so this, the Hodgkin-Huxley model does model the spike itself. So it builds up, then it has this mass, it looks more uh, 
faster here, right? But if you stretch out and then really zero in on the on the time axis, so we're only covering just a, a I think 10 milliseconds on the time axis. I should have labeled the time axis here, sorry. I should have labeled this time axis for that matter. And this vertical axis should be uh, um, membrane potential. <clears throat> anyway, from the, t from the peak of this spike to this little trough is about two milliseconds, two one thousandth of a second. During that time, even when there's input current coming into the Hodgkin-Huxley neuron, it's still not going to um, integrate anything. It just kind of ignores it. Nothing really happens. So suppose we give a constant input V in, hold it constant over time. Turns out we can solve the differential equation analytically between spikes. So um, from the time from when the voltage is zero to the time the voltage equals one, in between there it follows the differential equation. So I claim that this function here is a solution of this differential equation, actually this um, initial value problem, IVP. <clears throat> so um, this IVP says that starting at a voltage of zero, follow these dynamics, and if you do, this is what the formula looks like. How do you prove that that's the solution? It's a simple plug it in and show that left hand side equals right hand side. So plug in the solution and show left hand side equals right hand side. By I mean plug the solution into the DE. Plug in the solution to the differential equation, not PE, DE. And I think that's, I've, I've left that as an exercise on uh, something you can try. Okay, what does the solution look like? Well, it's, um, if you look at this formula up here, they, um, as time goes to infinity, this exponent gets really negative, and so that exponential part goes to zero. So then the entire, uh, the entire right-hand side of that formula goes to V sub n. And it'll approach V sub n asymptotically. Now importantly, V, for the neuron to fire an action potential, V n has to be bigger than one. If one is up here, then uh, the, the membrane potential will level off below the threshold and will never um, spike. Instead, if the V in is below, sorry, if V in is above one, then at this point, it reaches the threshold, right? The voltage reaches, the membrane potential reaches the threshold and a spike happens. So you have a spike happening here. We have to wait the refractory time. And then we can start integrating again. And if the V in is held constant at the same level, it'll It'll do the exactly the same trajectory as it did before until it reaches another spike. Okay. Now, in the assignment, or sorry, in the exercises, I ask you to go and use, um, <clears throat> use this situation, use this solution with a fixed input current to come up with a formula for the average firing rate for a given uh, input current. And the way the, the way the exercise walks you through this is to, um, the firing rate is one over the inter-spike interval. So a spike happens here and a spike happened here. So this in between is the inter-spike interval. And so that's one over the firing rate. Now, that interspike interval has two parts to it. There's the refractory period, and then there's the what, I'm, what I typically call T star, which is the time it takes to go from V equals zero to V equals one. So you put those two things together. Um, you get T interspike interval, and then you take the reciprocal of that. When you've done all that, and hopefully you try the, um, the exercise, you'll see that 
Um, g of Vn, g is a function that's um, representing the sort of activity, or in this case, the firing rate of the neuron, has two parts. If Vn is above the threshold of 1, then the firing rate is 1 over tau ref minus tau m times natural log of 1 minus 1 over v in. Let me move that over a little bit. And the firing rate, of course, is 0 for v in less than 1. Well, what happens when Vn equals exactly 1? I guess that's kind of an, it, a weird situation because um, I guess it would I guess it would never actually spike. So I guess the firing rate would be 0 then. Okay. Typical values for the refractory period is about 2 milliseconds. And the membrane time constant, about 20 milliseconds. It depends on the neuron, actually. But in terms um, of... In terms of getting reasonable numbers for running these simulations, um, 20 milliseconds is around the right range, anywhere from like 10 to 50 or 100 milliseconds. Um, by the way, in the exercises, I do have um, a simulation or some code that simulates the leaky integrating fire neuron. And I ask you to complete one little part of it. Um, so you should look at the exercise. All right, let's look at even simpler neuron models. <clears throat> now, um, I guess I should point out this graph here, um, which I sort of skipped over. This shows the plot of this formula for um, varying V in uh, values. So V in is set to 0.5, like I said, the firing rate, which is the vertical axis, would be zero. So this plot goes along here. As soon as the, the Vn is above one, we start to get um, the neuron firing. So for example, when the Vn is two, the firing rate is around, I don't know, 62 um, hertz, right? Hertz is uh, occurrences per second, so uh, spikes per second. So this um, is what we call the tuning curve. because it tells us about how that neuron reacts to different input currents. And this sort of curve is quite, um, quite often seen in, in neuroscience. Um, <clears throat> so you'll notice that to the left, for negative input currents, or low or negative input currents, you get no firing. To the right, it, um, it rises up. And in fact, if you were to follow this out further and further, it would eventually go asymptotic. It takes quite a while, but it does um, asymptote out at a certain value. And uh, you can figure out, um, I'll leave it as a challenge for you, how, what would the maximum firing rate be? And you can, you can work it out. Um, you can probably take the limit of, of this thing as Vn goes to infinity as well. Yeah, that'd be, that would make sense. Okay, so there are other types of, there are other simpler formulas that have a similar kind of nature. So the activity is very low or zero when the input is low. And the activity goes up and approaches some maximum as the input increases. This general behavior can be represented by a number of different activation functions. In general, we call this kind of a sigmoidal uh, shape, but a number of different functions have that shape. So let's look at a couple of them, a few of them. The most common one that I see used is the logistic curve, and later on in the course, you'll see that there's a there's a sort of a nice mathematical feature about the, about the logistic curve and how it meshes with the probabilistic um, formulas. So, sigma is the 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 function name we often use for these sigmoidal uh, functions. Sigma of z, where z is the input current, is one over one plus e to the minus z. And if I were to draw that, it looks like this, it's asymptotic out here, passes through 0.5 when the input is zero, and then it goes up to one. So that's logistic function. Another one, arctan. Arctan of z, so that's the inverse of the tan function. 
it has the same shape. It's got a slope of one here, but it goes from minus pi over two up to pi over two asymptotically again on both sides. Same shape, same general shape. There are nuanced uh, differences between them. Another one, hyperbolic tangent. This is tan h of z. So if you want to know <clears throat> what that function is, it's got to do with exponential um, functions. It's a sum and it's a fairly simple expression with exponentials in it. You should know what hyperbolic tan is. Again, similar shape. I believe it's got a slope of one here, but it goes from minus one to positive one. So it's kind of convenient in that sense because it's sort of like this nice normalized um, uh, sigmoidal function. So those are three common options. Now, if you were to take um, the limit of that, let's say, um, let's say we're multiplying by some some constant in there a. As we choose bigger and bigger a values, this thing gets steeper and steeper. And in the limit, as a goes to infinity, we get a threshold function. Um, maybe I should have put the a over here. Um, typically, the threshold function is zero. if the input is less than zero and equals one if the input is greater than or equal to zero. So we have zero along here and then equals one up here. It's also it's also called the heavy side function. Um, the reason I said, uh, see it's, it, it goes between zero and one. Uh, you can imagine another version that goes from negative one up to one. Sure, whatever. It's just uh, a lot of these functions have uh, differences in the way um, they operate, but at the end of the day, um, they represent a class of functions that uh, achieve sort of the nonlinearity, the nonlinear aspects that we need to run these neural networks. Okay, so a bit away from the um, sigmoidal functions, and this is this the ReLU function or the rectified linear unit is one that doesn't go asymptotic on the on the right hand side but it just keeps climbing so ReLU is just a clipped linear function so i could i could just draw a line and it goes from negative infinity up to positive infinity but instead we clip it at zero so let me just redraw that so the ReLU comes along here and then goes up linearly. So one way to represent that is the max of zero and z. So this is a very commonly used activation function. Um, what I'm describing here are what are, are what are called activation functions. So these are the functions, and including um, including this tuning curve here. This is how the neuron takes its input and translates it into some activity, the activation function. So we've got the logistic activation function, the arctan, hyperbolic tangent, uh, threshold, uh, or heavy side if you like, rectified linear unit. These are all common activation functions that are used in neural network uh, programming. Another one, which I'll just quickly mention, is the leaky ReLU. Um, I won't write the formula, but it's the same sort of thing as as the ReLU, except it goes negative a bit. And there are some advantages to that, but I won't, we, we won't look at them right now. And I think there's another version that has just a negative slope. So the slope changes. It's two linear functions that go together, but they just change slopes at the origin. <clears throat> okay, now those activation functions, all you need to know is the input current, and then you can compute the neuron's activation. There are some activation functions which are very useful that act on a collection of neurons. So these are multi-neuron activation functions. So let's look at a few of these. Softmax is like a probability distribution or a probability vector. So it's elements add to one. What we have is a collection of neurons in the output. So maybe we've got five neurons in the output now each of those, the values of each of those will depend on the values of all the others. And you'll see that in a second. So let's say Z is the input current 
uh, for all these. So the z is a vector because we've got z0, z1, z2, z3, z4 feeding into these um, five neurons. <clears throat> so the soft max of z, um, so let's look at z, uh, let, let's think of the index i, I guess. So let's say these are indexed by i. So when you run this soft max activation function on this collection of output neurons, let's look at the ith element of that. It's equal to e to the z i divided by the sum over j of e to the z j. <clears throat> so basically, you look at the input current, uh, z, uh, let's say z i, and then you imagine that each neuron is e to that. And then you basically normalize all those activations according to their sum. So you, if you, you might have seen the softmax in um, statistical courses. So then by definition, just by the way it's designed, if you add up all those softmaxes, they equal one. So in that sense, it creates a probability distribution. Um, so as an example, I've got a bunch of input currents here. Notice that some of them are negative and, and some are bigger than one. The, the input currents are not, um, are not a distribution, but you take the exponential of all those and then you normalize them according to their sum and you get soft max. And in this case, I believe those numbers are this 0 0.06, 0 0.9, 0 0.009, and 0 0.031. Does that add up? I'm not sure, whatever. And so graphically, here are the input currents, but here is the soft max, and that looks like a probability distribution. All the values are between zero and one, and they add up to one. And now again, if you were to take the, um, the limit of that, um, again, you can imagine uh, throwing some constant in here I'll, I'll erase that because we're not throwing a constant in there. But if you were, you could imagine taking the limit of this uh, softmax function to get what we call a one-hot. It's an extreme of the softmax where only the largest element remains non-zero while the others go go to zero. So in this, in the example we have up here, the one-hot would give us. Well, this is the maximum here, so it would be 0, 1, 0, 0. So that gives you a survey of um, simpler, some of the simpler neuron models. Throughout most of this course, we're going to use things like the logistic function or, or the hyperbolic tan function or the ReLU function. Those are activation functions that um, are often used in neural networks where you get that each neuron is adding up its input to get its input current, and its input current goes through this activation function to get the neuron's activity.